very clever man. Uh, he knew intuitively that there must be a problem here. So he drew all the structures for polyglycine, which is an achiral amino acid. And uh, therefore, he didn't draw a single polyalanine structure. He drew only polyglycine structures. So he was strictly correct. The question that was asked uh, uh, many years later was that uh, Tatke Pauling gave a lecture in New York. And uh, there was this guy who stood up to the back of the audience and began to argue with him. Uh, that was Morris Huggins, who never really got along with Pauling, because uh, he never got any credit for the work that he did. Morris Higgins noted that for amino acids with the correct absolute configuration, all the Pauling structures would lead to a short contact, and therefore they would be disallowed. Now, the absolute configuration had been determined really in an anomalous dispersion work done by Bacon. Question at that time was, was Pauling aware of this? Pauling was certainly aware of this at that time, and, uh, but he had just ignored it. But if you use the Ramachandran map, you will immediately get the right side of the helix. Because if you use an L amino acid, these would be the allowed regions of Ramachandran space. If you use a D amino acid, these would be the allowed regions of Ramachandran space. If you use the helicodidal angles here, you will get a right handed helix. If you use the helicodidal angles there, you will get a left handed helix. So the stereotypical or the chirality problem is actually solved if you use Ramachandran. The chirality problem is one that students do, should think about because uh, it is sometimes uh, <coughs> quite interesting. And uh, I think in the evolution of our ideas on uh, stereochemistry, chirality, and so forth, beginning with Pasteur, uh, these are the names that uh, come to mind. But I would really, at some point or the other, ask students to look at this because you know, the DNA, for example, that's left-handed DNA, and that's right-handed DNA. Uh, now, the hand of the Watson Crick double helix, of course, is the right-handed double helix. Left-handed DNA is present occasionally. But uh, nature, in 1993, celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Watson Crick paper by putting the double helix on its cover. And when they put the double helix on its cover, it turned out that the double helix was actually left-handed. And after the journal came out, uh, the critics immediately pointed out that nature was not even aware that uh, the most famous structure published on their pages actually had hands. Uh, but it does turn out that very difficult to uh, distinguish between these if you look very carefully. Uh, the journal Resonance also celebrated, I think, I don't I should not say celebrated, uh, the journal uh, Resonance uh, commemorated really or noted the passing of Francis Crick by producing a special issue. And they have this structure of uh, DNA drawn by an artist. And sure enough, the structure of DNA was left handed. And the night before it was to go to the press, one of my colleagues who was serving the editor, he, asked, he called me and told me, look, this structure on the cover has the wrong hand. What should I do? So I told him, don't do anything, just print it. And uh, uh, afterwards, uh, find out how many people actually tell you that it's wrong. And when anybody writes and you're wrong, you triumphantly say, that's exactly what I wanted to find out. And now we'll give you an award. We'll give you a one year free subscription. <laughs> The reference and the problem will be solved. And as luck would have it, nobody ever wrote in saying that uh, it had the wrong hand. But if you want to know a little bit about this at the Curie Club, you might actually do this. There is a site on the internet which actually catalogs all the wrong structures of DNA, all the left handed structures. There's someone faithfully maintaining uh, uh, an internet site. Uh, in my own laboratory, sometimes this problem of hand gets in uh, to my thinking. So many years ago, I made a molecule which had a helix of one hand, and then joined together with a helix of another hand. So you have a screw which goes uh, sometimes this way and sometimes that way. And we characterize it crystallographically. After this, I was wondering whether such a molecule would have any use. Uh, so I would ask my colleagues at the uh, coffee club whether there was any use for a screw which went one way sometime and another way uh, somewhere else. 
And all my engineering colleagues would tell me that uh, uh, this is why you are doing biology. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I was finding it very difficult to justify why we done this. The only reason I could have this molecule made was I was interested in getting a racemic crystal. And so I asked a student of mine to make uh, one half of this molecule with L amino acids and the other half with D amino acids. Uh, he made both of these and I wanted to mix them together and make a racemic crystal so that the phase problem would be solved in the center of symmetric space flow. And uh, when he did this, every time he mixed these things and crystallized, uh, we would get spontaneous evolution. Uh, so you get only L crystals and uh, D crystals. Spontaneous resolution is something that you never get if you try. Uh, if you repeat Pasteur's experiment, you'll never, uh, you'll never work out the way it for Pasteur because it depends very much on the conditions of the experiment. The Paris temperature at that time and uh, temperature where you're doing it will not quite match uh, conditions of nucleation. So the student of mine said, what do I do? I now make these two molecules. So I just took well join them together. Anyway, to know how to make these bonds, so just make one long molecule. So we got a molecule which looks like this. So in searching for a use for molecules, if you look at the molecule, you can't decide that it has both hands, but it does. It's half one way and the other half the other way. That's what it would look like. So one time I was given a seminar at the Central Drug Research Institute in Lucknow. I put this up for hoping that somebody would tell me something about it. And sure enough, after I went back to Bangalore, uh, some chap sent me an email saying that, look, go and read this uh, issue of, uh, I think it was Hindu. I lost the reference. But there was an article in Hindu which uh, highlighted this particular paper, which says, spontaneous helix hand reversal and temporary perversion in climbing plants. And uh, where you see these mixed helices are, uh, I think in the, era of the cell, in the era of the cell phone, you no longer have landlines, I think, in most, in most places. But when we did have these phones, you would find that all those coils will just coil impossibly. And you never, and you look carefully, you'll find they were left-handed for some time and right-handed for some time, and then got completely mixed up. But physicists, theoretical physicists and mathematicians who are always looking in biology to, uh, for a problem actually studied this. They studied the problem of troublesome telephone cords and they took their inspiration from uh, biology, which I showed you here. So if you come to our campus uh, in front of our Center for Ecological Sciences, you will find this very, very rare uh, tree uh, it is from the Western Guards, but if you look at it, you will clearly find uh, a biological object in which uh, left and right handed helices are very beautifully formed. So, much of this kind of work has its origins uh, really in an understanding of the Ramachandra and Torsion angles, their signs, uh, how it relates to the chirality of the residues that you use, and uh, we use the ideas that we gather all the time. Uh, I will really uh, uh, conclude showing you a picture of Ramachandran and by telling you that uh, in uh, 19, uh, I guess in 1973, a long time before most of you were born, uh, I received an appointment letter from the Indian Institute of Science appointing me as a lecturer. And uh, I, after that, got a letter from Ramachandran saying, I will be in Chicago, and uh, will you come meet me? So, of course, I went all the way to Chicago in those days by uh, bus and uh, met him. Uh, so, when I entered his room, uh, uh, he wasn't a man given to a great deal of niceties and uh, uh, polite conversations. And the first question he asked me was, he didn't ask me, uh, where I'd come from, what I was doing, where I was coming to Bangalore. He didn't ask me any of those. First thing he asked me is, uh, do you know anything about the structure of collagen? And uh, my immediate answer to that, and I had been trained in the United States, so I was a graduate student, and graduate students were not afraid of professors. So I simply said, uh, 
I don't know. And uh, I, I, I honestly did not know anything about it. And uh, after that, he didn't ask me any further questions. But then after a little while, uh, he said, I'm going for lunch. So I got up and then followed him. So we went to a cafeteria. We took uh, something in the American cafeteria on the tray, sat down and ate it in silence. And uh, when this was over, I asked him, uh, can I, uh, is there anything else? He said, no, you can talk. I went back to where I had come from, uh, not quite knowing uh, uh, what it was. I arrived a few months later in Bangalore and once again went to see him. Now this time he was a little bit more animated. He asked me, do you know what's going on college? And I said, yes, I read about it. But that time I read a little bit. I had a sense that what all this was all about. And then he immediately asked me, can you distinguish between uh, so, uh, some structure of collagen and some other structure of collagen? And uh, I had to confess that I didn't have a clue as to how to do a distinction you know, between these structures, but I, by what then were the emerging techniques of uh, NMR spectroscopy, which I had studied. And uh, it was only many years later that I recognized that uh, uh, by sitting and listening, that these ideas were hugely important in understanding the way biopolymers actually fold and uh, adopt the structures that they do. And I think we are all uh, greatly indebted uh, to the kind of work uh, that we did in the 1950s and 60s. There is so much of complaining nowadays on uh, the nature of science that is done that I think occasionally we ought to look for uh, role models who have worked under very, very difficult conditions at times when as science was not as well supported as it is today. And Ramachandran is one of those role models I think whom we would do well uh, to think about once in a while. I will of course conclude with a picture of uh, the building of the very old institution in which Ramachandran actually got his PhD degree, was a student, came back many years later uh, to start a new department. And I'm rather grateful that he did start the department and come to Bangalore because if he hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have the opportunity to be here today to tell you all about it. So thank you.